difficult people. These, this is your, your friends, Eugene Clark. Everyone say hello to Eugene. Eugene hello, Clark. everyone. There he is. <laughs> and he's got his beverage. Uh, and this is Matt Faulkner, Eugene Clark. Uh, uh, you. How are you today? Matt Faulkner, I am splendid. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, it's good to be here with you. Uh, we're going to today, ooh, I'm going to, I'm going to set this thing. Today, we're going to talk about, what are we going to talk about today, Eugene? Um, we are going to talk about um, artworks that depict moments in history um, that are relative to uh, social uh, justice and civil rights and things like that. Okay, so we're doing this too because of the war in the Ukraine and uh, we're honoring, we want to just talk about how artists have involved themselves in the discourse and right. even like kind of had an effect on it by their um, participation in things that they've made. So um, uh, yeah, so first I just want to acknowledge, yeah, that. Um, there is a tremendous suffering and death and war crimes uh, happening maybe as we speak over there. And um, we um, just want to say we support um, the end to this war. I mean, I'll, I, I'm assuming you feel that way, Gene, too. We're probably preaching to the choir, too, out there and saying this. But um, how do artists address moments like these? That's what we're talking about today. Okay, I like it. All right, so we're going to start. Um, Eugene, you're going to share your screen first. You have okay. an artist that um, you have an image that was um, that really resonated for you. We'll talk about that for a moment. Yes, this is artist Paul Cadmus, and this is his depiction of a uh, a massacre that occurred in southern Illinois in a city known as Heron. And this was um, coal miners that uh, were being massacred uh, by the union workers who were on strike. And the people that were being massacred were brought in, they were non-union workers. And then it's the old story uh, where owners think to uh, go against something uh, like a union and, uh, you know, uh, implement something like this. So uh, this particular piece, when I first saw it back when I was in my early 20s in art school, um, it really resonated with me. It stuck with me all these years um, as a way for artists to be able to get involved in social injustice and be able to visually help people to understand uh, the just the severity of what would be taking place. Yeah, and did you say the date yet when this happened? Yeah, it happened in the 1940s. Wow. 1940s? Yeah, the 1940s is when this massacre occurred. Wow. You never hear about this one. <laughs> I never, I, yeah. I didn't. I know. Never. There's there's so many moments in history like this, I think, you know, not just in our country, but as you as you embark on your own you know, quest of learning more about history, we uncover things that seem to have gotten lost. Yeah, yeah. So um, these, the people who are doing the killing and the, uh, um, you know, brutalized are the ones who are in the union doing it to yeah. the non-union, which is interesting too, because a lot of, uh, a lot of times in regard to unions, you see the union busters beating up union people. But this is a flip on this one because the, the union people are beating up the non-union people. Yes, 
because they're taking away their jobs and their jobs are being uh, violated. And, and unfortunately, it just erupted into a violent uh, act and lives were lost. Yeah. So, um, boy, what a dramatic um, layout on this, too, uh, with these, uh, you know, the, the figures sprawled on the ground, right? I mean, the, the re Cadmus uh, rendering of the, the human figure is so convincing. Um, and the partially or the nude um, just, just splayed out there. It, it looks so vulnerable, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. And, you know, when you see massacres, historical, uh, historically painted massacres uh, that may have been done about, you know, certain historical moments, whether it's Civil War or Spanish War or, you know, other, other wars that have been painted, mm -hmm. uh, they never, they never do, in, they never do indicate uh, figures in this manner. So I think that this was a lot of really risk taking on the part of the artist who was also known for several other uh, works that he did that were controversial for other subject matter that we can talk about in a future podcast. Yeah. And, and one other thing then too is like, uh, so the way he's uh, presented like a hierarchy of visual of, of things for us to look at as the viewers, you have the um, beautifully rendered uh, figures on the bottom, then you have the violent mob and that bloody hand raised up with the pipe um, in the middle ground. And then there's like two background things, the, the crowd of the union workers, looks like one of them is drinking from a bottle so that alcohol was involved. Uh, just the way that guy in the brown shirt who's holding a gun is standing, the way he's rendered, he's like kind of a blue, um, a uh, uh, flesh tone next to the guy who has a like a piece of wood in his hand with a white yeah. shirt on just the difference between those two it's it's just eerie looking it really is and then you have that scene way in the back right the tree. um it's a very interesting spatial relationship um it's not really necessarily deep space it's a little bit more shallow space but he really is able to uh, give us so much depth yeah. from that foreground to the background. And then was there like, is there a woman stomping on the guy who's dead on the ground there? It appears that way. Yeah, and another guy's being hung. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You just, know, yeah, go ahead. Just unbelievable, you know, when you see images like this because it's very graphic. And it doesn't leave a lot to the imagination per se when you think about massacres. Um, and when you think about uh, Paul Cadmus, he started his career in the 30s. And so um, I don't have the date of this, this actual painting, but uh, the event took place in the 40s. And he did a lot of paintings thereafter. So I would imagine this was painted maybe in the 50s. Wow. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that one. Are you good with that? Do you want to do you want to have more to say? Or? Yeah, no, let's. Uh, All right. Let's. What gonna, do you have? We're going to go backwards now <laughs> in time. Um, let me share my screen. This is oh, what are you doing there? Uh, this is called the third, I think the third of May by Francisco Goya. It is depicting uh, when the French army invaded Spain, uh, they overran a part of the country and then some uh, Spanish uh, civilians, I don't know if it was the army or not, took the town back, this one particular town. And then the French came back, uh, you know, with their imperial army and, and captured everybody. And then the next day, they or all through the day, they shot everybody, <laughs> uh, all the people who were in the town who had, they just assumed participated, so they killed everyone. 
uh, all of them um, not armed. You know, it was just a firing squad. So um, Goya calls these his black paintings. There's a series of, I think this fits in that series. Uh, there's a bunch of other ones. Um, and I guess the other ones he doesn't really give names to in the black painting series. But, you know, just in this, it's, um, you know, the word black is, I guess, to connotate um, <coughs> that he used black yeah. in this, but also, you know, it's, it's the mood, his mood and the mood of the, the world that he's depicting. Sure. Uh, so. And, you know, Francisco Goya, I think his reputation for those of us that may have had a chance to study a little bit of his art, you know, um, he's no stranger to imagery that can really um, stir the imagination of um, not just a historical scene like this, but in terms of, you know, some of the paintings where he really got into painting monsters and things like that. Yeah, like dream imagery. There's that one image of a monster eating the figure of a, it's a, whether it's a, it's like, I heard a poet once talk about it saying it's like, you know, the, the idea of the parent eating the child. Um, he was starting to, to get into these, or he did get into these things that whether he was intentionally doing or not, he was um, talking about depth of uh, the darkness of human experience. Uh, yeah. in the dream world and uh, feelings. Um, so this is all, so this happened in 1808 during the period of, uh, I believe it's Napoleonic um, armies of France marching around the world and uh, wow. taken over. But this must have been, I think it was supposed to be at dawn, um, but they have some kind of square lantern there to light up the people they're shooting. Um, yeah. You see that, that, that's, I, it's interesting to me. Um, yeah, so I'm not with that. Ahead. Oh, I'm just saying that that's new for me. I, I don't think I'm familiar with that particular type of device. Yeah, I mean, okay, so if he's depicting reality, then yeah, the, the French troops must have brought these lanterns, which must have been like candles inside of uh, boxes made out of tissue and uh, set them up around there so that they could light up the people they were gonna kill all night long, uh, which is just bizarre. Uh, but him depicting it too, I mean, one of the things about this that was so startling, I think, to why it's still around, why, pe why people still relate to this image is because not nobody had done this kind of thing before. Yeah. You mean in terms of uh, uh, painters, depicting imagery like this yeah uh, picking a moment and saying well uh, this is a he's he's relating i think he painted this not long after it happened so um that that's my guess i don't know exactly when he painted it but i'm assuming that so one of the aspects of this was the immediacy of this experience he he was uh like being a cell phone uh around uh you know, police brutality um, towards like, people of color. Hey, yeah, today, Black if, we bring, if we bring up what's going on in Ukraine or even uh, of recent memory, uh, when we say the name George Floyd and what that means to everybody in terms of um, a brutal act of killing by police to an African-American uh, male being George Floyd, um, everything was captured, you know, second by second on cell phones and then posted worldwide through social media. Well, of course, 1800s, that's not apparent. So who and what and where and how are they going to get across this information? You have a person like this wonderful artist who took that role and brought this image to our not only imaginations at that moment but this painting has withstood the test of time so that you and I can talk about it 
Yeah, I mean, just this whole thing about the lantern there, what it what it's saying in the story that it's telling is this was so intentional that they were going to kill all these people that they knew they were going to have to do it all night long and they were going to make it like a machine. Let's set up the lights properly so we can really see them and shoot everybody dead. <laughs> yeah. It's like uh, that kind of immediacy we see now. And that's one of the things we hear with cell phones is uh, maybe a lot of the reasons for the Black Lives uh, Movement Black Lives Matter movement is because there are cell phones that you could see a lot of the stuff that people talked about before, but didn't feel safe enough to actually report. Now, everybody's taking pictures of everything all the time. So yeah, um, yes. But in, in a sense, well, not in a sense. I mean, he, he was the being a cell phone carrier at the time, communicating this horror of humans treating other humans this way. Amazing. So, well, you know, you look at artists like Goya and you just think about how, you know, uh, there must have been a moment for any artist when you're painting something like this, especially at that time when uh, there's a lot of unrest and you think about the risks that the artist is taking. Uh, but yet, it was worth taking those risks, apparently, enough for this artist to do this wonderful painting. So, you know, just the, br the bravery that it takes for people to speak out. You know, it's the same thing as somebody stepping forward with a cell phone image now, right? You know, like, what consequence does that have for them? What consequence did painting this have for Goya? I don't know. But I can imagine he's Spanish, right? And yeah. the French imperial, imperial armies marching around his country. If he painted this around the same time, what did that do for his future? What kind of consequences did he have for stepping up and making this image? Um, right. So, all right. Are you good with this one? We'll shift over to the last one we have. Perfect. All right. Let me uh, do this. Not that one, not that one, that one. Aha. So Norman Rockwell painted this in 1965. It is depicting the murders of the three freedom riders, Cheney, oh, that's a bad thing. Cheney, Schwermer, and there's one more. I forget the third guy's name. I will look this up when we start to talk because it's important to hear their names. So, um, yeah, this is the image of the three young men who were part of the Freedom Summer of bringing uh, information to voters in Mississippi in 1965, I think was the year. Uh, yeah. They were uh, kidnapped, uh, first arrested by the police, you know, just driving while uh, one of them was, I think one of, I know one of them was uh, Jewish. Uh, we can see here one of them was Black. Uh, they just happened to be driving while, while being three young men trying to promote education and about voting and, and education too. The part of that program was to bring um, more uh, education to the kids in the area uh, during the summer. And they brought them out to near a dam and tortured them first. The black man apparently was also uh, mutilated prior to being uh, killed, I mean tortured. Uh, and then uh, shot the three of them and then buried them in a, a landfill next to a dam. Oh my gosh. So what do you think about this image, Eugene? Pretty hard yeah. to look at, huh? I think just like the other images, it's horrific. And it does uh, have a lot of emotional content based on the imagery. And, you know, this the choice of Rockwell's moment frozen in time and how you have one figure on the ground that apparently has already been killed. And then the kneeling figure, which depicts probably the, you know, just the sheer pain and suffering that's happening prior to being killed. And then the third figure, which is trying to uh, hold up that 
kneeling figure as if to, in the last seconds of one's life, what you might do to protect or to console or to just support, knowing that it's probably not going to do much. Yeah, and it's the end of his, you know, life too coming up. Uh, just what a moment. Um, what do you think of the shadow work in this? Uh, that's the ominous thing in, in this for me. It's both the limited color, the red is the, you know, everything else is sepia, brown uh, and black. I don't even know if there's black in there. It could just be sepia and mixed with a little bit of ultramarine blue or something, maybe indigo, but, um, and then that magenta red on the African-American man's shoulder. It's the shadows and that red to me, like, the symbol is the symbology of the shadow cutting across the back of the man who is laying prone on the ground, and then the shadow crawling up the thigh of the African American man and onto his torso, and the shadows on the ground of the killers. That is, um, it's really powerful to me. Yeah, it's. It's just very interesting, the vantage point. You know, we're, we're not seeing this from the, necessarily from the eyes of the victims, but I would say more from the vantage point of the people that were doing the killing. Yeah. I have, I have two more images for this because um, we got, how much time do we have left here? Yeah, we're almost done. So I'm just gonna show these quickly. First of all, here's the sketch that he did, which really interesting when I look at, compare these two, that oh, yeah. is not the same kind of effect, is it? For me. Uh, it's quite different. And I think, you know, when we talk to students about uh, creating a page out of, let's just say a graphic novel and you do nine images and scale that page down to three and you're being selective, to tell the story uh, in sequence, how this is a great example of how uh, that process takes place so that you understand that Rockwell had a vision, had an understanding of the event and was trying to zone in and, and, and figure out the best way to tell that story and um, not seeing the killer's identities, but seeing them more as a shadow, sometimes can even be more powerful because yeah. imagination takes over. Yeah, you know, there's, and just with that said, uh, uh, we're running out of time here, but uh, the, the issue of um, the shadows, in the implication, it's running along the lines of the same thing as, um, for me anyway, of Alfred Hitchcock, the great, you know, thriller, horror movie. Um, so much of his scary stuff was implied. And, right. he, and it allowed the viewer to use their own imagination to fill in and create and put their own scary monsters into the shadow. Right. And that made it even more frightening. Yeah. I mean, and, and actually what we see so much in movies today where, you know, we've got to see blood dripping off of everything and the monsters, you know, how many we can count how many teeth they have and, you know, everything's so explicit in your face. We're going to tell you everything. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the, 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 the way that things are presented when it's like this, uh, the powerful nature and the impact I think is stronger uh, when you think of it from that standpoint. You know, our imagine we have to give the viewer a lot of credit to have the ability to imagine something that's even greater than what we might portray. Yeah. And and then lastly, I'm going to show to this image of uh, Norman's process, Norman Rockwell's process. He would do a lot of reference work. So um, there, you can see his Lincoln, Lincoln painting uh, up in the, it looks like Lincoln's looking over the uh, divider there down at the, these two guys. But 
this is one of the things about um, that we talk, I, you know, get reference material. The power yeah. of the image is a reliance on a lot of times nature. What is nature yeah. telling us? How do I learn from nature to, to um, use what nature? So when you just look at these two, I mean, it's, it's so clear. It's so part of the power is its believability, which is based upon the research that he did. Right. Reference photos. Yeah. And I think what you just showed, the preliminary drawing and this photo, doesn't get any better than that to really get that point across. Yeah. All righty. I'm going to take it out of screen share. So you and me would come to the end of our time together with our pals out there Hopefully. in Save World Make Art Land. I hope that we've saved the world a little bit today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, you know, and when we say Save World Make Art, we're not talking, right, we're, we're talking about which world are we talking about? The world, greater world at large, like Goya's and Cadmus painting and Norm Rockwell's, or are we talking about our world just around us? they're not mutually exclusive <laughs> right we're just making art and that can help save a lot of things large and right. small so well spoken thank you sir we're going to be back right eugene we're going to talk about other stuff soon we're keeping this going we're going to add 20 new episodes yeah starting now and we're going to do a little uh, a little odyssey a little our own little pilgrimage which we will uh soon we're going to uh where, where are we going in Pennsylvania? We're going to Brandywine. Brandywine. Yeah. Because we're doing a little research for bringing other people there. That is kind of the, the home of the sort of the birth of American um, visual storytelling. Illustration is the Brandywine School and the Brandywine Museum and the Delaware Museum of Art. So we're going to head there soon and we'll bring you along with us. We'll do, uh, we're going to do at least a couple, maybe. Uh, um broadcast from there right oh yeah absolutely it will give you a feel of the place awesome well eugene we've uh we've had fun again uh and uh we didn't break anything and didn't get into too much trouble so this is a good thing just from that vantage point yes absolutely we uh we thank you for giving us a few minutes to take a listen and a, and a visual a tour through some social unrest and civil rights uh, imagery that uh, has created an impact over time uh, through uh, fine artists like the ones that we uh, discussed today. All right, that's well put. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you, everybody. Right. Take care. Peace out. Bye-bye.